Okay. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Um, sponsors Classflow, Blackboard Collaborate, and of course, eLearning Revolution Project. Next thing that we'd like to do is uh, the whiteboard is enabled. So let's go ahead and use our pointer and point to your location. I personally am from St. Louis, so I'm going to plug in St. Louis. Someone seems to be near St. Louis. Someone from Louisiana, go ahead and write in the chat where you're from as well. I'm going to do that too. And that's from Arkansas. Becky's from Phoenix. GM is from the middle of the Pacific <laughs> in Hawaii. Great. Yeah, uh, Peggy was mentioning to me that we've had kind of a low turnout um, to this conferences, but we're just going to go ahead and move forward. I'm excited to be with uh, the four or five of you. Uh, hopefully more people will join kind of as we go ahead and get going. Um, my presentation today is uh, what I would say, uh, what I call a framework for e-learning. Um, first thing I'd like to mention is that um, all of the complementary technologies I'm going to be sharing with you today, I also created uh, basically a simulator that you can use to take with you, and I'm going to put that link here in the chat. So this is a great place for you to access all of the different technologies that I share today. So, so it don't feel the need to sit and visually take notes necessarily, um, but simulator is a great way for do some to do some cloud bookmarking. Um, you can share these with students, colleagues. They can add them to their own symbols. They can uh, create their own symbols, things like that. So this, uh, I created a web mix here at Symbol. Um This presentation, I'm also going to be showcasing an e-learning module. For this module to truly work, you need to be enrolled in it. And I would love to be able to collaborate with you all. I'll share my contact information at the end of the presentation. But I would love for you guys to be interested in being enrolled in the module and seeing some of the other online things that I have built. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I can share the link to this. Uh, but even if you were to you know, try to get into it now without being enrolled, you're really not going to be able to see uh, the module to its fullest potential. Another thing that I want to do is I'd like to attribute the, the owners of the content that some of them are sharing. For example, these, these vector images that you see here of the camera and at the, as a book bookmark, these are created from the NOM project. And these are free, free vectors that you could actually download and use as long as you cite their sources, cite, cite their creator. And I've shared that in the chat. Uh, so the NOM project is a great place you can go and get these vectors and you can use them for educational uses for free. Uh, for e-learning for free, like the, the e-learning that we're doing right now, as long as you attribute the creators of that. For a nominal fee, you can actually purchase these and uh, use them in your for other uses and not have to attribute the author. Another thing that I did is the color palette for this presentation was created using Adobe Cooler. Uh, you could use, I'm sharing that here in the chat as well. And again, if you're, you know, have this open up under the tab, don't forget that all of this is found in the symbol. Adobe Cooler is a great place where you can go and browse color palettes that are already uh, in use, which is what uh, I did. But you can also create your own custom color palettes from an image as well, which I've done when I'm creating websites and things like that. Take a look at the bottom left and the bottom right. This is where I'm going to be citing who the authors of these uh, photographers are of these images. All of, Most of the images of the presentation are created from uh, Flickr Creative Commons. These are images that are fair use that you can freely use in your uh, e-learning or other things. So I will be citing their authors down in the lower left. And then also, not all of the ideas that I'm presenting in this presentation are all mine. So I'm going to be, as best as I can, citing the original um, original authors of, of those ideas and things like that in the lower right. I also am on a live Twitter chat right now. I mean, many of you perhaps are following me or following at least the Learning14 hashtag. I also would recommend, you know, I mean, imagine us connecting and continuing this conversation after this presentation. And I would love to do that with you by connecting on Twitter, but also perhaps chatting about this specifically, we can use the hashtag eLearning framework. I know it's kind of a, a large hashtag, but I would love to be able to chat with you in that. And if you, perhaps you're not using something like, uh, 
perhaps you're not using something like TweetDeck like me, maybe you uh, can check out, or maybe you're even using, using Twitter. The link that I just put in the chat, uh, this will actually show you those two hashtags combined. So you can kind of see, uh, I think all of it's just been by me, but you can see all the instances over the last few days that I've chatted both eLearning Framework and hashtag learning 14. So again, I hope we can continue the conversation after this presentation. A little about me. Um, I've been involved at, in e-learning uh, for, for almost 10 years. Um, I consider myself very much an e-learner. I love to learn online. I, I often tell people that I'm a closet cafeteria mooker. Uh, I'm currently in three books right now. And um, I'm a wannabe researcher, and I keep a blog of my interests, and I hope you guys will connect with me, and perhaps we can read each other's blogs. Uh, here this next year, I hope to have a few things more formally coming out with my involvement in MOOCs. Um, over the last five years, I've professionally been an instructional designer and trainer for a team that has that's responsible at my university for about 550 online courses taught by faculty all around the world. And we currently have about 9,000 students across the globe. These students represent 64 countries and about 50 states. Um, I've been teaching also my own, three of my own web design courses online that I created since 2011. And I still keep in touch with many of my 250 students on Twitter and LinkedIn, things like that. But what I'm most excited about is my involvement in MOOCs, and I'm hoping to be wayfinding my first MOOC at the end of the year on the Canvas network. A wayfinder, if you don't know what that is, that's someone who facilitates a CMOOC or can connect to this MOOC. And if you're wondering what the E is, it's not something you were weird. It's just, I thought it'd be cool to communicate and extend this online piece afforded when you use, you know, the term e-learning. And if you Google e-teacher or e-designer, you'll get many different things. So if there isn't any questions, I, I'm, I'm not great at following the chat and presenting at the same time, but I'm going to kind of look quickly to see if there is any questions. It seems like we're having more people join us, and that is, that is great. Um, but if there's any questions, I'm going to go ahead and get going. But as you can see here, I'm attributing the Creative Commons image down in the lower lower left. So you may be surprised that you're sitting here today with an instructional designer, and I'm not going to be talking to you today about a prescriptive process. If you Google e-learning framework, you'll be able to see many people doing so. But I believe that while we um, feel like e-learning has been around for a while, the field is still very much evolving. So maybe there, in my opinion, there shouldn't be an X, Y, and a Z if you're going to conduct some sort of e-learning. And I'm sure we would all agree that technology is changing, but has learning changed? That's what I'd like to ask. Has, has our learners changed? Or is it what our learners want? Is that, is that what's changing? Learners have been learning since they were born, essentially the same way their entire life, because learning hasn't changed. The same is true for all learning, for, for all learners since the dawn of time, because learning hasn't changed. So please don't think of e-learning as a new way to learn. We can discuss methods and mediums about learning, but it's still the same. So I think of tonight's presentation as a way for us to talk about some things that I believe we should think about whenever we're designing anything involving e-learning. What we discuss here today could apply to MOOCs. It could apply to flip classes. It could about apply to K-12 e-learning. Um, and as I'm sitting here on a hot cup of coffee, I hope you're doing so too. So just think of tonight as a conversation. But why do I call this a framework? Well, I do believe this is a framework because, as I'm going to show you, you know, here's the definition of what a framework is from Meridian Webster. A framework is the structure of something, but most importantly, it's a set of ideas that provide support for something. Think of this as like we think of the Constitution, the United States Constitution being a set of conceptual ideas. So these are the set of ideas that I believe that we should consider as we, that these set of ideas support this concept of e-learning. Again, this is just my personal framework of mine that I'm sharing with you today, and perhaps um, you may here tonight, I'm hoping, can kind of walk away with a new way of thinking about our students, a new way of thinking about what to do when we're designing e-learning, what type of e-learning courses to offer, things like that. 
And, I, and, a, and another thing I want to mention is that another thing is that not all of these ideas are my own. And as, I'll see, as you'll see in the bottom right, you'll see where I cite the, the sources. So the first one that I'd like to talk about tonight is this notion of us learning alone. Um, no matter no matter what we do, uh, there is no essentially no classroom. We, right, we're right here right now in an e-learning experience. We're not in a classroom. We're all in different different places around the world, staring at our monitors, connecting through our screens. So no matter how interactive it is, there's still no classroom, and there's still no you that is a teacher in an e-learning module. This may not be an original idea from Michelle Pekansky Brock, but it's definitely a, a key one for me. That, I, that I've learned as an, as an e-teacher and things like that because, you know, our students and e-learning experiences are, like I said, essentially learning alone. Yes, this has its advantages and disadvantages of learning alone. Um, perhaps learning alone is why someone chose to, to take e-learning versus being in a face-to-face -face classroom. You know, disadvantages, you know, um, could be, or advantages could be, you know, um, potentially, they save time, cut costs, they don't have to drive to class, they can go to class in their pajamas. You know, we've heard all these types of things. But still, as Michelle Vacancy Brock puts it, you know, when you read her book and hear her at a conference, she talks about how students are essentially isolated from their peers and their instructors. So what, what does that mean? This happens, you know, when students feel alone, these three things, you know. We would obviously want to decrease their anxieties. We'd want to get them to use the technology, and we'd want to make sure that they have a desire to essentially complete the e-learning experience. And yes, it's obviously more easier said than done. But there's been much research here recently uh, in discussion about how to combat these issues, specifically over the last few years. Some would say that a learner feels like they are learning alone because they're essentially missing one element. This next page here is a cue for me to share a video, and I'm going to share the video in the chat, and I'm also going to share it up here in the web tour as well. Um, a recent, I don't know if you're seeing the commercial like I am. Um, the video is about the video, I can't remember, I think it's about uh, about two minutes long. But it's a video created from the Dow Chemical Company. And I saw, I came across this video in the in a Canvas course, no, open course MOOC that I took um, called uh, The Human Element, an Essential Online Course Component. And they shared this video, and I thought it would help, you know, communicate what I'm trying to communicate here for us today. Okay, the video just ended for me, but I'm going to give maybe just a few more seconds for those of you who are still watching the video. Maybe if you could shoot me a message in the chat to let me know that you're done.
Thanks, thanks, uh, Leanne, Peggy. Uh, this course that I took that had this video in it, it was a great way to open up. I mean, essentially the whole course was talking about the human element. Um, but also this course is one of my favorite MOOC experiences because it did have this element. I was truly connected with other students around the material, chatted with them on Twitter, and many of them I'm still connected with today. Uh, maybe even some of you have were in this course, I don't know. Um, some other MOOCs and e-learning experiences that I've had in the past were not set up this way, even courses that I've personally designed in the past. Um, I know, you know, I know firsthand that some of my own personal learners have even had anxiety. So I've talked to them on the phone about e-learning, how difficult it is. Um, perhaps they have those anxieties because they felt alone. And as much as we design our online experiences to be the same way as they should go face in a face-to-face -face class, without that human element, their learning may not be successful. Um, but does every e-learning experience need to have the human element? Um, I'd like to use the analogy of fast food. Um, I personally eat fast food all the time. And it's, you know, you show up, you order, it's very efficient, you see from a bright menu exactly what you want to order, you know exactly how much it costs, you show up to the window, you get your food, and you essentially can go eat it in your car, take it home very fast and efficient. I'm a father of three and uh, three kids. I used to be able to say I have three kids, three and under. I can't say that anymore because my oldest just turned four. But we definitely, unfortunately, have to get fast food quite a bit. Um, but essentially, you know, a MOOC or other online courses can be this, the same way. Um, depending on the objectives of the learner, you know, us or our learners, or their goals of us or perhaps our, our learners, or maybe the objectives of the course, and even the objectives of the institution, sometimes learning, it's, it's perfectly fine for it to be quick, cheap, and easy. And some MOOCs and other online experiences can be designed that way. But then again, you know, maybe you have a course with the human element. You know, let's all take a look at this image. Such a beautiful image that I found here on Flickr. This is a family sitting down to a home-cooked meal. And I'm guessing you see something and you're perhaps feeling something very different than thinking of this in terms of fast food. Um, here, imagine if you were part of this group. You would feel like you're part of this group and you're contributing to the conversation and you're very interested, I'm guessing, to what's being talked about at this table. This could be Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner or something. You're very interested, you're enjoying, you have a longing to be there. Perhaps you want to design, many of us, I'm guessing, are here today because you want to enrich your e-learning experience. You want to perhaps have your students feel like they're part of the conversation. Um, there's much to be discussed in terms of how to write discussion questions or how to use emerging technologies to increase their, their personalization or personalizing feedback. You know, this presentation isn't really going to be going all of the, over all of those things specifically, um, but I am going to be highlighting uh, some of you, some of them for us today. A while back, I came across an article from Educause, which really helped me understand more so how I should teach. And as, uh, and as a field, we've even, we've even been talking about uh, Ray Kurzweil's learning by doing for some time. Uh, much of the buzz in K-12 lately has even been uh, interested in this learning by doing or the maker movement. Um, another presenter earlier today, uh, Jackie Gerstein, was talking about this in her presentation. Um, she's such an expert practitioner in this and talking about the maker movement in her keynote. Um, and if you miss it this morning, be sure you check out the YouTube channel. But, um, and also, the, my department here where I teach and, and design courses, we use this image to discuss, you know, the different levels of learning in both face-to-face -face and online classes and how we train our new instructors. We use this when we're training new instructors. But maybe you've seen a similar matrix. Maybe you've been in a class that had low teaching and low learning. Maybe you were in a course where the instructor was trying really hard, but you still had a difficult time trying to learn from them. But this article from Marilyn Lombardi discusses the value of learning by doing. She shared that, you know, we should be using the technology available to assist in problem solving, give students real-world problems and ill-defined problems, et cetera. Um, doesn't that sound like much more authentic? A quick example of this is an instructional designer for e-learning. I'm often worked with with faculty that are very reluctant. You know, they teach face-to-face -face just fine, but then they're asked, they're said, hey, hey, now you have to go teach online. So I have some of them that come to me and say, hey, here's my PowerPoints. I'd just like you to put them in the course. Um, uh, that's all I need to do. Here's my PowerPoints. Put them in the course. I'll discuss with them in the discussion area. But essentially, you know, obviously, 
that's not very authentic. One, because they're not getting you from that presentation because those PowerPoints are meant for a face-to-face -face class and should be there to guide your conversation as you're lecturing to them. Online, there needs to be some sort of transition to, to, to bring you into the course and make that learning much more authentic. I've even had instructors in the past that have come to me and said, hey, is it possible for students to mail me their final thought? I mean, are you talking email? No, I mean, I actually want them to mail them to me so that I can write on top of them and mail them back to them. You know, um, you know, they are examples of instructors who are not using the technology available to them in, pro in problem solving, and they're essentially going against the technology in some cases. But when students are involved in high learning, whether or not the technology is high, the student isn't disconnected. Students have been learning, like I said earlier, students have been learning since the dawn of civilization. It's nothing new, but when learning is authentic, especially in an online setting, um, it builds community of engaged learners, provides opportunities for collaboration, demonstrates relevance of learning, and transfers learning to new situations. Remember what I mentioned earlier, that learning is nothing new. I think I said that right 50 times now. Um, our learners are still learning the same way they have, you know, forever, since they've been an infant. But like I said, learning, if learning was authentic, then it builds community of engaged learners, provides opportunities for collaboration, and demonstrates relevance of learning, and transfers learning to new situations. And don't forget, you know, think of authentic learning. Think of the human element. So whenever I'm designing a new learning experience, I believe there's a need to think of ways to put the student in the center of our designs. Then try to figure out ways or different events, activities, assignments that will get them to interact with each other, interact with the instructor, interact with the content. So when we have, you know, these student to student, student to instructor, or student to content types of interactions, you know, that makes the learning much more authentic. Uh, student to student could be maybe designing group activities, you know, writing discussion questions in a way that fosters interaction. Um, student to instructor may be designing activities where the instructor can provide some formative feedback along through the course, rather than just turning in a final paper at the end. Imagine if the students could submit drafts of the paper throughout the, throughout the course. Uh, depending on the uh, expectations of the learner, the institution may be students may need to have one-on-one -on -one with their instructor over Skype or something like that. Um, students to content. You know, as a designer, that's where I come in a lot, is I try to design interactive pieces. And if you go into that course that I shared, uh, you'll be able to see some of that. Perhaps you've heard about gamification. I'm sure we all, you all have. But, you know, that philosophy, um, excuse me, isn't just, you know, isn't just, when you think of gamification, it isn't just class based elements or some sort of an object that students play a game. You know, an entire course can be thought of, essentially, as gamification. You know, you could put your students in a real-world problem. You can all involve the, the entire course in a scenario. And this all could be done in the discussion area. But that makes the learning much more authentic. But, you know, think about it. If you ask someone about a class they really enjoy, you ask them why they like it, I'm guessing 99% of the time they're going to mention some sort of activity or game that they played with the class in a way that they connected with other students. Um, when I teach my capstone web design class, um, I, tr I actually have students pitch to the pitch to a client, and essentially the client is you know the entire class. So everyone is pitching to the class their design for their website. But and I've noticed by merely putting them in the scenario, I've seen greater retention and more creative projects than I did back in the back in, when I first started teaching the course, where I just had them just do the project. But again, not to get off on a tangent, but the more types of activities that you can find in e-learning experience that are that that give that interaction between the student and the content, student and the peers, student and the instructor makes the learning much more authentic. The next aspect of our framework that I'd like to talk about is um, because it's important to think about, you know, interactive content can sometimes be a double, what I would say is like a double-edged sword. It could be distracting. If there's new tools, you know, Web 2.0, that these new tools come out all the time. You know, we have uh, every day you go on Twitter and there's the latest and greatest new tool. I mean, here in this conference, I've got probably five new tools that I can't wait to check out. But do these inventions truly innovate learning? And what I want to point out is that not all of these inventions are truly necessarily innovative. So before I start showing off some technology here in a moment, I want to show off one, I want to talk about one thing. It's about increasing learning 
not necessarily using just a new technology for the new technology's sake. I'm sure you've heard other people say that. And now you're probably wondering, well, hey, it's almost dinner time. At least it is for me. Why am I showing us images of chocolate chips? <laughs> uh, but if you go to Wikipedia, you can figure out exactly how the chocolate chip was invented. But according to Wikipedia, in 1937, when Ruth Graves, Graves Wakefield of Toll House in, in the town of Whitman, Massachusetts, she invented the chocolate chip essentially by accident. And what I'm getting at is that using these broken pieces of chocolate in an innovative way, even if by accident, made America's favorite cookie, which was later capitalized on, capitalized by Nestle, and the name of Toll House was, was branded. But it takes an innovator like Ruth to try something new with something that's been around for perhaps thousands of years. The same is true for us today with technology, especially when it comes to e-learning. But what I often find is people in the industry are talking more about the noun and not the verb. It's not about what LMS you use. It's about what you do with the LMS. It's not about whether you're using Prezi or PowerPoint. It's about how you engage your audience with your presentation. Can you take something like simple as Twitter that you use all the time and use it for in, in, in the classroom? There's lots of inventions out there, and we don't have to use them all. But it's about what we get the students to do with them that really matters. Remember, learning is nothing new. The next aspect of our framework that I would like to mention is that some things can distract learning. So another part of the framework that I would like to instill with us today is that not everything in an e-learning, everything in the e-learning experience must add value. And um, when I teach my online web design courses, it's really hard to teach new web design students that everything on their website needs to be adding value. The functionality, the, the colors, Everything on a website must add value. And essentially, if it's not, the learner or the user of the website isn't going to be able to get to their content. And the content is what the users want most, and it's what they need. So they expect to have this. They also expect the content to be in a very specific place. And if it's not there, then they're going to return to their Google search or ask Siri for, for another search result. You know, we've heard the phrase, the customer's always right. But in a website, the user's always right. And in our case today, the e-learner is always right. And as we know, the design and functionality of the site affects them getting to that content, like I've been saying. But when they, when they actually, when they, when they get what they want, and they get what they want, they see what they want, they experience the way they want, obviously the learner will be happy. So that's why it's very important to make sure that the functionality should always add value, design should always add value, content should always add value. So I always think of this in terms of whenever I'm designing or building some sort of an interaction or if I'm putting colors or into a course, things like that. Even this presentation here that I built today, I tried to make it very simple and sleek because I didn't want things to be distracting for you. Um, sometimes I'm on projects, or re especially when I'm redesigning older courses, and I see things like animated GIFs or font colors that really do not work. And obviously, that's going to be distracting. And I often wonder how in the world is it that our learners can learn from this? Because um, essentially, when they're distracted, the learner it decreases obviously the learner's ability to meet the, their goals, and also decreases their ability to accomplish the objectives. I'm going to take a break from talking and take a few sips of some coffee. Um, and I'd like to see, hey, Peggy, is there any specific questions that I need to address before I move forward? I'm about to jump into showing some screenshots of the e-learning module. Well, I just asked one that I would love to have you talk about. And that is, do you have a way for evaluating added value? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it, you, you kind of have to figure out and balance it in terms of is it, is, it, is it helping you to accomplish a specific objective? Is it, is, it, is it helping you accomplish some sort of a goal? If it isn't, then I would say perhaps uh, an animated GIF is, is distracting. Is there a reason for it to be there? If it's not specifically helping them to see something on the page or helping them accomplish an objective or, or a goal, then I, I would say that it, that it doesn't have value. Great, great question, Peggy. Any other questions? Uh, Peggy asks, is the value added for the e-learner or, or the instructor or the goals? I mean, you're right. The, I mean, 
the instructor has goals of the course, the institution has goals of the course, but also the e-learner has goals of the course. And I'm guessing that they want to obviously accomplish the course and complete the course, get the grade that they want. And sometimes we can put things into courses that can essentially distract them from accomplishing those objectives and achieving those goals. And again, I'm going to be showing some screenshots of a, of a module, like I said earlier. I don't know if you were here at the very beginning, but this module, I'm going to go ahead and throw the, throw the link into the chat. Um, you can take a look at it, and I'm going to be showing some screenshots of it. But the problem is, unless you're officially enrolled into the course, there's going to be some functionality that's not going to, not going to work. Um, so definitely contact me after this presentation. I can actually get you enrolled into this course. You can see all the functionality and everything. And remember, I'm going to be going through some quick tools. Um, I'm going to be going through some quick tools, and all of these are curated for you on a Symbaloo. And I'm going to go ahead and throw that link out again. Getting a question here from, from Peggy. She said, shouldn't all learning be authentic? Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, uh, M. Walker, all learning should be authentic. Um, all of our, our learning experience should be authentic, but then sometimes there could be a need, maybe maybe the, the purposes of the, of the course, it, I mean, obviously all learning should be authentic, but what I'm saying is maybe it could be just depending on the objectives, maybe they just need to go in and memorize some facts. Maybe they just need to go in and experience some concepts. Maybe they don't need to have such an enriching experience where they're connecting with learners all around the world like we are kind of doing right now. You know, there could be a need, I would say, where there could be e-learning experiences that don't really need to be that authentic. It's almost like they're just reading a book and taking a test. I mean, I would hope that it's more than that, but there could be situations where that's all that could be needed, in my opinion. And again, if you're interested in chatting with me on Twitter, we're using the e-learning framework hashtag and learning14 hashtag. So here is a screenshot. If you get into the module, I don't know if you're doing that perhaps under the tab, you will see this is the first page of the e-learning module. And this is a module that I recently built for some librarians in higher ed who want to increase their digital media literacy of their library patient, patrons. So taking into account the audience of the module and the needs, you know, the very first page of this module, I wanted to make sure that I personalized it for their experience, and I wanted to get them engaged. And I wanted to make sure they knew uh, what sometimes instructional designers call the WIFM, which W-I-F-M, which stands for, um, hang on, I just almost forgot what it stands for. The WIFM stands for what's in it for me. So I wanted to make sure they clearly knew all the expectations right up front. So think of doing, perhaps you maybe think of doing something similar in your courses, adding a video to introduce the students to the learning. And I'm guessing, I'm hoping that it would add value. And there's much research out there today that would say that have, if you're going to have a video in your courses, you'll probably be under six minutes yet. Um, but think of you taking an e-learning experience, and that, would that perhaps personalize your experience by, you know, by having it, your being welcomed into the course by your instructor, being welcomed into experience and knowing exactly what the course is going to happen. I have videos in my courses that I teach and I actually demo for them exactly where everything is in the course. Um, while this may sound simple and trivial, it, it can help personalize the learning experience for, for students and perhaps um, remember that, that they're not, they, while they are learning and learning, maybe they won't feel as alone. The next thing here is, um, this is a tool that I would like to share. This is a tool called Tiki Toki, which is a great way to have interactive timelines that you can maybe make a timeline online that uh, people could just experience and view, or you can give them actually editing rights where they actually could edit it and experience and add to it themselves. And I'm going to put that into the chat. This is the actual timeline that was built here, but definitely check out the tool for your own use and consider using it uh, for perhaps one of your inverted experiences. Um, so this interactive timeline, Tiki Toki, uh, the students here can share links, media, and they can add them to the timeline. Perhaps uh, as an instructor, you would have such a timeline created for your students to explore, or, uh, or maybe uh, students can, can add to it as well. And then as I continue on with the, 
here just kind of the little middle part of, of the module, because there is going to be moments where they're not necessarily interact, interactive piece. There is, you know, the presentation of some content. And this module goes on with some basic background material about digital and media literacy. Um, so I'm just going to kind of click through a couple things, just simple text and images for this module. And remember, while I'm not showing you the module in its entirety, there is, you know, one page in the module at the beginning that presents basically some basic data, data of libraries in the digital age. Conveniently, this particular group of libraries were really wanting to learn more about infographics and their use and how to create them. So this data on this page here, that I know it's kind of a little blurry, but uh, which you can see if you get in the module, this data is on the next page was presented in an infographic. And I'm just going to show what that, just a brief little snippet of what that infographic looked like. So this, so then they, they saw some data in text form and then they kind of saw, so, and then they kind of saw the data presented in an infographic. And then on the next page we had a discussion where we were able to kind of talk on one hand, you know, what is the, the biggest challenge for librarians in digital age, but then also we were also chatting about the differences in how they experience the data versus just a simple text, but then also experience it in terms of the format of an infographic. Then we get to a spot in the course where they actually were asked to read an article. So to get them excited about this article, um, what, I, what, what, it, what the module talks about is they actually receive a word cloud. And the word cloud is based on all of the text in the article. So the, the, the elements of the word cloud, the, 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 the words in the word cloud are actually the ones that are most prevalent in the article stick out. And I'm going to share the tool that is used to create that word cloud. So what you could do is you can actually copy and paste the entire text of an article into Wordle, and it can make you a word cloud. Or you can just start adding the text yourself. You can actually add in a URL into Wordle, and it will pull all the text, and you can create your word cloud as well. And that here, this is just a snippet of an image to kind of communicate, you know, what they're going to be kind of getting in their in the article they're about to read. Students maybe could use these word clouds. Uh, in personal presentations, you could use it when you're designing e-learning experiences. Maybe you can put it in an infographic, which I'll talk about here in just a second. Now, on the next page, this is just an example of the actual article. And one of the activities that they then went on to do is they actually had an assignment in the course where they were going to use uh, an infographic tool called PictoChart. So here's the link for PictoChart. Again, I wish I was demoing with you for some of this stuff, but also for the sake of time, I'm, I'm not demoing some of these things. But I would love to give this presentation to you guys in a live form, perhaps at a conference sometime. But anyways, this, the students in this module then were able to take the data from, that they were reading about in the article, and then they all created their own infographics of the data using the free web tool PictoChart. And then we got to a spot in the course where they, where we kind of talked about Twitter and the use of Twitter um, in the classroom. And you can actually embed uh, Twitter chats, maybe perhaps on the home page of a course. That's what I personally do. Maybe you would embed uh, a Twitter chat in a specific module based on a specific hashtag. This is an example of the Twitter hashtag DM literacy. You're probably wondering, well, Dave, why isn't there any tweets in here? That's because what's populated in these widgets is only for like 21 days. So, um, by the time I took this screenshot, it wasn't there, um, which is unfortunate. But here's an example of because you actually can click on get more tweets or whatever, and then you can actually see the Twitter chat that was going on about digital media literacy. And you know, I just would like to take a stop and, and think about the use of Twitter uh, in your online class. You know, because uh, it's something that our learners may be used on an everyday basis. And then essentially, you, in my opinion, you're taking the course outside of the course, the walls of the course, and you're putting it in something they access all the time. And um, and also maybe as a way, think of your course as a way to incorporate uh, maybe alumni who've taken your course previously. Maybe they're going to be continuing to follow the hashtag for your course and tweeting with your current students. Maybe that would add value to the experience. Another neat thing is that perhaps if you embed these Twitter chats about current hashtags that are really heavily used in Twitter right now, then essentially you're bringing outside content that you're not even teaching. You're bringing the world into your classroom and your students are seeing it and experiencing it 
And I would be careful with that because sometimes, you know, you can get some, some things on Twitter maybe you wouldn't want your students to see, especially if you're teaching in K-12. Something to consider. But essentially, you can be inviting the world into your class. And I love that aspect of using something like Twitter uh, in a class. Because I would hope that maybe bringing the world into your class maybe would really add value. So that's kind of the end of the module. I just wanted to briefly showcase a couple of tools. Um, there's definitely a couple other tools that I threw into that symbol that I would like you to uh, have fun checking out as well. But let's just do a quick recap where we are so far. Um, we've discussed learning alone, the human elements, authentic learning, online interaction. I spent a little time talking about the difference between the invention and innovation, adding value. And now we're kind of left to discuss uh, something very important, which is the e-learner. So when you think of the e-learner, check this out. Um, while learning isn't changing, our learners are changing. And perhaps through their use of technology and the current technology trends, for example, they're, I mean, take a look at, like, this is an example of the Popple inauguration in 2005. And now I'm going to show you 2013. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen some of these images online, but obviously this is, you know, completely worlds different from 2005 and 2013. Same experience, same type of an event, but obviously now in 2013, the people are experiencing the event in very different ways. Um, same is true for e-learning. E-learners want the learning perhaps to be free. They want it on their phones. They want badges instead of grades. Um, you know, somewhere between five and seven million students have taken at least one online course. I read a study recently that said that. And twice as many institutions are offering at least one online course than they did a few years ago. You know, I don't know if you've heard of it, the, the world record for MOOCs, the largest MOOC ever, is 300,000 students. And that is a MOOC from Udacity's uh, CS 101 courses, computer science course. So what do we do? Well, um, it's all, and like I always tell my web design students, it's not about, it's always about the user and their needs. And the e-learner, you know, they want to connect with their peers socially. They want to connect with their, their instructors socially. They want learning to come outside of the course's walls and into their pockets. And they want access to the content on their devices and social media. And they, they, they don't want to learn alone. They want to feel connected. But yet, there's still something key that's missing from this list. And I actually didn't have it on the list earlier for, for a reason. That's us, the e-teacher. The e-teacher, you know, well, first, let me show you this analogy. This analogy, I saw it at a conference a while back, and I've Googled it a million times, and I can't find it. Um, but basically, imagine you're up in a blimp with a whole bunch of your students. This is an, an image of the Los Angeles skyline. Um, this, I love this image, it's so surreal. And imagine you take all of your students up in a blimp and you're flying them across the Los Angeles skyline and you're, the whole purpose of them being up there in the blimp is you're going to teach them some geography about urban sprawl. But instead of encouraging your students to look outside of the blimp and look at the landscape around them, you're telling them to turn to chapter seven in the geography book and forcing them to look at a globe that you're holding up in front of the, at the front of the blimp. See, some teachers are very reluctant and don't feel up to the innovation and are worried about what it could potentially do to their class. I doubt many of you are that way, but maybe you work with people or you have colleagues that are the same uh, that perhaps feel that way. E-learning may not be very new to us, but it could be for some of our students and other people that we work with. So what is an e-teacher to do? E-teachers tell their students to look outside the blimp and observe the world around them. And that's what I'm hoping I'm inspiring them to do today. Sometimes we may think of teaching online as different than teaching in a face-to-face -face course. It is a very different experience, but essentially teaching is teaching. Just like learning is the same as it been since the dawn of time. I said that a bunch earlier in the presentation. Teaching is still, in a lot of ways, very much the same. And it's been going on in the same way, just through different mediums and stuff, of course. So what makes a teacher successful in an online classroom is no different than what makes them successful in a face-to-face -face classroom. Content expertise, attentiveness to students, timely responses to student questions, and being an organized are just a few examples of what makes a successful teacher in a face-to-face -face class and what makes a successful teacher in an online class. 
technology will come and go, and we will continue to migrate content from one platform to another. I just recently, for the last two years, have been migrating content from Blackboard, Web C Blackboard Vista to, to Instructure Canvas. It took two years to migrate 500 courses. Uh, you know, same is true. Like, a few years ago, 10 years ago, we were all on MySpace, now we're on Facebook. You know, technology is always changing. Content is what the learners need, and it's up to us to make sure that the technology doesn't get into the way. Here's a quote that I came across from Scott Robinson from Plymouth Mount State University. We don't want technology to drive the change. It's up to the instructor to determine what the learning objectives are, and then look at how certain tools might get them there better, faster, easier. I love that quote. So I'm going to take some time and let's uh, answer some questions. I mean, I'm going to throw up my contact information. I'd like to invite you to follow me on Twitter. Uh, here is a link to my blog. And, uh, and then also, I'm on LinkedIn. There's my email. Um, let me, let's go ahead and answer some, oh wait, before I do answer questions, I do want to remind one thing. And when you go to the symbol, you're going to see uh, one tile for tool collaboration. And I'm going to show that spreadsheet. Here's a link to that. There is the spreadsheet. This is a spreadsheet that I use to collaborate with lots of people on where we share tools and talk about them. And I invite you to join the spreadsheet. Join it with me, check out these tools, add tools to it, things like that. I hope we can collaborate in that way. But also, obviously, follow each other on Twitter and things like that, too. So what questions do you have? Uh, Peggy, if you could help me go through the chat and pick out a few questions to answer, I would love. We have about another 15 minutes. I didn't see too many questions. Uh, Dave, we were making lots of comments uh, to each other, um, lots of interest mm -hmm. in um, the the criteria and what makes it authentic. And um, I was one of my questions was about um, the the criteria for I believe that you called it attention to students, and I was thinking or equating that with the importance of relationships among students, between teachers and students, and all of that, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Do you see those as the same? Um, building relations, yeah. I mean, I, I think faculty and teachers need to build relationships. You said relationships with students. Right? Relationships between students, between students and teachers, and teachers and students, sort of the whole whole mix of that, I think, becomes really important in the learning environment, which may be going beyond what you meant when you said attention to students was important. No, not necessarily. I think um, what, what, what makes an effective teacher in an online class is very similar. I mean, what makes an effective teacher in a face-to-face -face class is the same thing that makes an effective teacher in an online class. I work with many faculty who think mm -hmm. that teaching online is easier when it's actually, in my opinion, more work. I mean, my institution actually pays you more to teach online because it is more work. And I think that there's a different level of connection. It's a lot easier in a face-to-face in -face class for students just to come up to you after, after class um, and, ch and chat with you. Online, they don't really have that ability. They're, they're having to communicate with you through text. And they're sending you emails. And they took them time to write that email. It's, it's a lot, the, the interaction between the faculty member and the student is a lot more maybe professional which could be a good way, a good, a good thing. But it's, mm -hmm. a little bit, it's a little bit difficult for a uh, student to approach an online instructor because they have to write an email. It has to be very formal. You know, so I would just encourage, especially in online, to make sure that you're building that relationship with, with your students. Oh, great. I think so, too. Do you find that uh, being an online instructor means that you're basically on line 24-7. How do you manage that? I, I agree. I mean, especially with, if you do, if your institution uses Canvas, you actually have the ability to send so much communication to your email. And then you can actually respond from your email and actually goes into the course. And students never even know that you're not in the course. Um, so essentially, that does really make you on all the time. You could actually have communication sent to your cell phone 
and you can respond as a text message into the course, and the students get it, and they don't even have your cell phone number, um, just as an example. But, um, but yeah, I do think that effective online teacher does need to have a presence in the online class at least every day. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I would agree with it. I, that's probably one of the organizational management tools that the instructors need to have to be able to keep some balance in their life. Yeah. See, Annette said that she tends to log in every day, at least to keep contact. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I probably log in, obviously, more than once. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, I think students need to see that you have a presence in the discussion area. If students are asking you questions, um, they need to be, because they're essentially, they're waiting. They can be waiting for days for an answer. And the whole class could be essentially be waiting for you to respond. In my online classes, I really try to empower I, one of the things that I set up is I actually set up a general questions area where I tell students to ask all of their questions here publicly in a similar way that they would in a face-to-face -face class. Rather than, I think by default, a lot of students try to just send you emails, and then essentially you could be answering the same question 10 different times to 10 different students. And yes. So I try to get all of my students to ask the questions publicly, and then I can go in there and address them publicly, unless, of course, it's a, a private matter. Well, and I think another advantage to that general question um, format is that students can answer each other's questions. Is that, you oh, know, I was going to ask you how you manage, because I think this is often an issue with e-learning. How do you manage it so that students view each other as resources in the course and aren't always expecting the teacher to respond, like in a forum, if they post a comment? How do you keep it from being a teacher-student kind of interaction? I, I really try to make sure everyone knows that I'm empowering everyone to help. <laughs> um, I will. Uh, I was actually at a MOOC right now that has probably about five or 6,000 students from Stanford. And I think at the very beginning of the MOOC, the instructor said, many of you are going to become the TAs in this MOOC because you're going to be interacting with everyone and helping them find resources. Or Because I because she actually couldn't get in there as much maybe as, yes. as many of us are accessing the yes. MOOC in the world. You know. Yeah, I think sometimes online, a lot of the people, depending on where the course falls in their program, especially if it's a student's first time online, a lot of the questions could just be, how do I turn in an assignment? Or how do I do this and this? And there could be experienced students in the course that could say, oh, make sure you go over here and do it this way. And then as an instructor, I would then come in and see that somebody helped somebody else out, and I would publicly say, hey, thanks, Sally, for helping Joey out. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You know. Um, so you do, yeah, that, you do that through the building of relationships and that, like John suggested, a professional learning community attitude rather than by, say, giving points or rewarding them in some way for a certain number of posts or responses. Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on people's teaching philosophy. Um, I 100% agree with John that there definitely needs to be a professional learning community within the course, and I actually hope to take that outside the course to things like Twitter yes. and extend that relationship with everybody outside the course even after it's over. But definitely from within the course, you know, I, I sometimes what I actually do is if I see, like, let's say I see students who aren't participating very well, but I see some students that are, I actually might one-on-one -on -one contact one of my leader students and say, hey, do you think you could try to be in a group with so-and-so, or do you think you could go over here and maybe see if this student might need a little bit of help because they're not really responding to me. And I've actually seen whenever I ask another student to go help out another student, that the student who was a little bit reluctant was really appreciative that another student in the class is volunteering to help them. Yes. And I think that that, one, really empowers certain students, but it also helps some of the maybe more reluctant, reluctant students as well. Definitely. I feel like it's really hard to be hidden and invisible in an online course. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, it engages all students and not just the ones who speak up in class. Yeah, especially with the ability of analytic data. I mean, yes. you can essentially find out that a student hasn't accessed the course in a week. You know? yes. And sometimes in my institution, we're, we're very worried about, oh, this student hasn't been in the class for so long, or this student should have dropped the course. I mean, we never really know why a student never drops the course. Maybe they're in the course just to purely get the financial aid money, which is unfortunate. 
you know, but definitely with analytic data, we can definitely try to contact the student, make sure they're okay, make sure that, see, because we want to take the technology out of it. Maybe they're having a trouble with the technology. Maybe there's something wrong with their browser. Maybe there's some sort of reason they're having trouble with right. the course. So maybe they felt terrible that they got an assignment, they didn't get an assignment in on time. And maybe it's, you know, hey, I, don't worry, I will accept that assignment in late. I want you in here in the course participating with us, learning with us in this professional learning community, like John said. Great point, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, you see any other questions unless anyone has a final question for Dave? I'm going to share one splash page, which is a great place to connect with me in terms of uh, this is kind of like a one-stop shop to get all of my social networking that I have online all in one spot. Uh, definitely you can connect with me there. You can have quick access to my Twitter, my blog. Uh, examples of some of the videos on YouTube, things like that. But again, I hope to connect with all of you on Twitter, and I hope we can continue the conversation there, and perhaps continue the conversation by following each other's blogs and um, uh, uh, continuing the learning outside of this experience. I am going to be presenting a similar presentation next week at the, um, the, the, the Re-Envisioning the Classroom Conference, which is also put on by the, the Learning Revolution Group. So I hope to see you all there as well. Yeah, thanks, Peggy, for moderating, and thank you for, uh, uh, for, for, for joining with us today.